Welcome to the second of two screencasts looking at key studies that you should try and learn uh, in order to illustrate your understanding of sociological research methods for the SY2 exam. So let's start by looking at some studies that you can use uh, as examples to illustrate your understanding of the main types of interviews used in sociological research. And for structured interviews, a good example to use is the Crime Survey uh, for England and Wales, which was previously called the British Crime Survey. And this survey is intended uh, to discover more about the crimes that the police do not know about or record. And it asks people uh, living in households in England and Wales about their experiences of crime uh, using a structured interview. And 51,000 people aged 16 and over uh, are interviewed using this method face-to-face uh, -face, and over 200 uh, professional interviewers are trained to conduct this important survey. So the Crime Survey for England and Wales uh, asked people resident in households about their experiences of crime in face-to-face -face structured interviews. And structured interviews enable researchers to make comparisons between groups uh, and over time. And it's also relatively easy to analyse uh, large amounts of data through the use of pre-coded answers like the ones that you can see on the screen at the moment. So structured interviews, remember, are essentially a questionnaire administered as a face-to-face -face interview. At the other extreme, though, we have unstructured interviews, and these are much more informal. These are much more like uh, a guided conversation. And an example of a study uh, based on this method is Anne Oakley's study on the experience of becoming a mother in British society called From Here to Maternity. And Oakley found that unstructured interviews enabled her to develop uh, close relationships of trust, and openness with the mothers concerned, which enabled them to speak for themselves uh, openly and personally and in detail about their experiences of motherhood. And this therefore increased the validity of their data. Unstructured interviews may be carried out with a group of people. And this can help to trigger off discussions, uh, encourage a dialogue to explore issues and gain more detailed and in-depth qualitative information. And these group interviews sometimes take the form of focus groups when the group interview focuses on a particular topic and people are free to talk to one another as well as the interviewer. An example of this approach is Paul Willis's study of working class boys in which he interviewed several of the lads together. Uh, the lads' activities in school uh, usually took place in a group context and a group interview would reflect this. Uh, and in these group interviews, Willis was also able to observe the interaction between the lads and they felt more at ease than when talking alone uh, to an older uh, middle class interviewer. And Paul Willis's research, I think, is also an example of what we call a case study. And a case study is an in-depth account of a single example. So in this case, uh, Paul Willis was looking at a single example of an anti-school subculture. In between structured and unstructured interviews, we've got semi-structured interviews. For example, Jill Green and Stephen Platt wanted to find out about the experience of stigma, so social shame, uh, amongst people who are HIV positive. And they interviewed 61 people using a semi-structured interview in which respondents were encouraged to elaborate on their answers. So whereas with structured interviews, you tend to get quantitative data, and with unstructured interviews, you tend to get qualitative data. Researchers can use semi-structured interviews to gather both types of data. As well as using examples of the main methods that sociologists use to collect data, uh, it's also a good idea to learn a couple of examples of studies that have used different types of sampling techniques. And for random sampling, uh, once again, we can use the example of the crime survey uh, for England and Wales. So the sampling frame 
for this survey uh, is the uh, small users postcode address file and this is stratified by police force area. So the sampling frame is stratified to obtain at least 650 interviews in each police force area and within each randomly selected household one, ad one adult aged 16 or over is selected for interview. So this sampling therefore uh, involves uh, a stratified random sampling technique. When sociologists don't have access to a sampling frame and remember a sampling frame is a list of all of the individuals within the target population so when they don't have access to this they have to use non-random sampling and one particular approach that they might use is a snowball sample so this is where the researcher may identify one or two people with the characteristics that they're interested in and then they ask these people to identify uh, other people. Uh, for example, Laurie Taylor, uh, in his work The Underworld, used this technique to investigate the lifestyles of criminals. So he happened to know a convicted criminal who was willing to put him in touch with other criminals who were willing to cooperate in his research. And the criminals, in turn, put him in touch with uh, other criminals and soon his sample gradually built up uh, just as a snowball gets bigger uh, as you roll it. However, although such samples are useful, particularly if you're studying uh, criminal and deviant groups, they are not random and are therefore unlikely to be representative. In addition to looking at primary data, it's important in the exam to be prepared for questions that might ask you about secondary data. For example, you might get a question about the usefulness of government statistics in sociological research, what we call uh, official statistics. And the census is a major source of official statistics by the government and also a good example of a factual social survey which is carried out uh, using, as you can see, self-completion questionnaires. And as the census has been carried out every 10 years since the year 1801, with the exception of 1941 during World War II, it's also, in effect, a longitudinal study of the entire population. And the census enables researchers to trace broad patterns of social change and to make comparisons between the social conditions of one period uh, and another. There are some types of official statistics that need to be treated with caution. For example, official statistics on crime only include crimes known to the police. So they don't take into account uh, those crimes uh, that go unreported or unrecorded by the police. Emil Durkheim's famous study of suicide used official statistics on suicide from a number of European countries in order to analyse the social causes of suicide. However, interpretivist sociologists argue that suicide statistics are simply social constructions reflecting the views of coroners and their definitions of a typical suicide case. Another type of secondary data used in sociological research is the use of personal documents, uh, which are sometimes also referred to as life documents and include things like letters, diaries and autobiographies. For example, Thomas and Zanecki studied national identity, particularly the process of becoming an American, by examining a number of personal documents that were generated by Polish immigrants to the United States of America. And these documents included things like diaries and letters sent home to Poland and provided an intimate insight into the lives uh, of these immigrants. Brown and Clare used personal autobiographies published since the mid-19th century to capture the experience of prison life from the position of the prisoners and they selected a broad range of prisoner writings and analysed the consistent themes and conflicts in the text. However, Brown and Clare recognise that many of the authors may not be representative of all prisoners 
and may write for different reasons, such as protesting their innocence or to campaign for prison reform. Now, some sociological studies use a variety of methods, and technically this is known as methodological pluralism. For example, sociologists might use different methods and different types of data to check that the results obtained by a particular method are valid and reliable. And this approach of using a range of methods, so usually at least two or three methods, to check findings is called triangulation. For example, Eileen Barker, in a study of the religious cult, the Moonies, used participant observation, uh, lasting a total of six years, uh, to gain first-hand insight into this religious cult. But she also supplemented this observational research with in-depth interviews to investigate the background of individual Moonies, and she also used questionnaires to obtain further information from a larger sample to make sure that her research was as representative as possible.